to. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, uh, for for having me uh, here for the for the uh, for the chair. I'm very honored, and and it's a special pleasure to be back in Brussels. Uh, it's uh, you know I have very close family ties here, so it's a special pleasure to be back in Brussels. Uh, it's, uh, it's also, of course, Patrick is being very modest. Uh, Patrick was probably the only person who read one part of my thesis very carefully. Uh, in fact, he's probably the only person who read parts of the proofs of my thesis, uh, even though he was not on my thesis committee. So this is a good thing because he read it, but I worry about what he does to his own students you know, when he's on the thesis committee. So I'm, I'm very prepared. So obviously it was not too bad. He's invited me back. So I'm, I'm especially grateful to Patrick. Uh, to, to, uh, we've known each other for, well, close to 30 years now. And uh, uh, so it's a special pleasure to be back and spend some time together catching up. Um, so very pleased to be back here. Uh, and this is a... Um, I think uh, I, I hope it will connect with you. That this is a, uh, a it, it, the paper. Is, it, the talk is based on a paper uh, which is available uh, on my website, and you can access it easily. But um, you will see that the, the talk itself will touch upon broader themes, and, and I've tried to think. I've taken the occasion of the lecture to think more broadly about. Um, integration and you could think of it as integration segregation um, and, and you know or you could think of it as integration and diversity uh, there are many expressions that that people have uh, some of them are like melting pot people think of the American the United States as a melting pot some people think of it as a salad bowl and, and so there are all these expressions one could one could think of and I will in the talk today, uh, it's a short talk, and so you know I will try and speak for about 50 minutes. Um, there will be many sort of resonances to these sort of ideas, um, and since this is also, you know, as as Patrick said, it's a uh, it's a talk, um, uh, which is, you know, I, I I imagine there are some economists in the audience, but there are also people outside of economics. So. So what I'll be doing is to try and give you a fairly general uh, background to you know, how we got interested in this. And um, so, so of course, this is a very contemporary topic. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about contemporary developments. But at, at an abstract level, um, you know, we, we think of diversity um, you know, as, as a value. Uh, we, we want to, we, we, we think of it as a value because we think we are, you know, each of us is, has our own values, has our own preferences, and we have likes and dislikes, and it's a value for liberal society to accept and, and to nurture and to these sorts of differences. It, this is, this can happen in the domain of religion, it can happen in the domain of language, food, a variety of contexts. And, and I think there is a sense in which personal identity, but also group identity, could prescribe or, or could set expectations on how you, should be, uh, how you should be conducting yourself, or what you should be doing, or what's valued in a particular domain. So, so often in a, in a modern society, but also in any society, you will have this tension. On the one hand, you want to do what others are doing around you, uh, so if people dress in a certain way, you want to dress the same way, most of us, uh, to, to, to not stand out. Or if people eat in a certain way, you want to eat the same way, you want to have the knife on the right side, the fork on the left side, and not eat with your hands. But in many cultures, it's the other way around. You're supposed to eat with your hands, and that's actually what it means to be eating with, with great relish. So, so I think there are different sort of standards people have, different ideas people might have about you know how they should behave. Uh, so, so there's this tension. You want to conform, and in fact, you want to conform at large. But different groups and different people may have different ideas about what they prefer to do. And so, what we're going to do today is, I'm going to actually, uh, in the formal part of the talk, I'm going to present an experiment on on how people uh, navigate these uh, sort of pressures. Okay. So, so that's sort of the uh, broader. Um, picture. So I've already said a bit about why you may, uh, why diversity is a good thing. 
uh, people may think it's a good thing because for intrinsic reasons, uh, because it's a value in itself, but it could also be, and, and economists have often thought of diversity in, let's say, an organizational context. You want people from different backgrounds, you want different types of people because that gives you diversity of opinions, gives you diversity of perspectives, and that makes it more likely that you will find the best practice. Okay, so, so that's, that's an idea that um, leads us to the view that diversity is valuable for instrumental uh, purposes. Okay, so, so what is the challenge? Um, so here's a slide which you know, one can spend many uh, talks on. Each of these uh, points is a, is a major, major point. So there are ma major sort of challenges to diversity, I would say. And I've just listed a few here, uh, but you can, you can clearly extend the list. So one uh, kind of major sort of contemporary development is large-scale immigration, which of course means people with rather different views um, uh, come in to move across societies, and then that challenge is that the challenge to diversity uh, becomes, you know, more uh, sort of, I think, more, um, I think it becomes more acute. Uh, there are, of course, identity-based movements, which also feed into this challenge to diversity, you could have gender-based um, sort of movements as was happening as is happening now, uh, the Me Too movement and so on. Uh, there are religious motivated sort of movements, uh, and you could think of other identity-based movements, you could think of race-based movements. Um, and so you can see that it's not just an academic problem, it's not just uh, you know, empirical, some sort of research people are doing on the side. These are very uh, current, very topical, very profound challenges. Uh, because um, I'm, I live in and I live in Cambridge, where uh, people uh, in the UK have voted to 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 essentially s slow down immigration. That's a key factor driving. Uh, there are many things people may say, but I think it's widely agreed that that's a key factor driving um, a concern about immigration. Is a key key factor driving the Brexit referendum vote. And of course, in, in, in America, you have the next this, this American president wanting to build a wall with Mexico. Uh, a lot of that is motivated by desire to control immigration. Okay. Uh, and um, although there is evidence that immigration has actually gone down significantly for Mexico, but that's by the way, if you like. So, um, of course, we know that in many countries in Europe, there is, of course, you could either say identity-driven or identity-threatened populism, uh, whether you know in the Hungarian elections recently uh, or in the French elections. Uh, in, in India itself, there is majoritarian-dominated populism, uh, which is quite extreme. And this last a couple of years ago, there was, of course, the, the election in the Netherlands. Where, um, so I think the idea that you value diversity, but the realization that there's a challenge uh, you know, to diversity. I think we, it's, it's a very contemporary, uh, very contemporary sort of topic. So let me just, uh, to connect a bit more broadly with intellectual sort of traditions, uh, let me put it in context. So this is not, of course, uh, there's nothing terribly new here. Um, so I think if you go back to the foundations of sociology, Already, uh, Durkheim was talking about a classical, so fundamental concern of sociology, which is how do you get cohesion in a society which is no longer reliant on religion, or as traditional societies were, how do you get cohesion in an industrial society? More recently, of course, Charles Woodhart has argued, uh, you know, he's the editor of the British magazine Prospect. And he's written a book arguing against immigration, uh, large-scale immigration, because he, he, uh, he believes that it's going to weaken social bonds and it's going to weaken society. Uh, and of course, you had Paul Collier here some years ago. Uh, you may remember some of you were probably here. And he's actually been very much in the, in the media also writing uh, about how uh, large-scale immigration could, could, um, could, could create problems for solidarity. Okay, and, and uh, so this is a very live debate in the UK. Just two weeks ago, um, there was a big meeting, in fact, with Charles Goodhart and, and um, some philosophers at, at the St. Paul's Cathedral in the UK with students 
uh, are sort of looking at this question of solidarity and social cohesion. And, uh, and most of the students were very much in favor of open immigration and were opposed to Brexit. And Charles Goodhart made the point that the students were not representative of society. And so, so I think this is not, this is very much being played out both in the intellectual domain but also in, in the political sphere. Uh, now, of course, many of these things were, um, I think, flagged in, in, in a way, in a very classic and very controversial piece by Samuel Huntington in the 1990s. Uh, so that actually is a remarkable piece. If you haven't, if you've not read it already, uh, it's a one piece I would say uh, it's worth reading, but both if you strongly disagree with it, it's especially worth reading because it is actually quite a thoughtful piece. Because you might think it's actually rather, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not very deep or it's not thought out, but it's actually very, very well thought out. And it's turned out to be quite prescient, I think. So, so I think that um, ideas about civilization or ideas about immigration and how that might conflict with diversity, how might that might create further challenges for diversity, I think have been around. Um, and there's also a very nice piece by Francis Fukuyama, which I want to touch upon very briefly. Uh, there's a forthcoming book by uh, Fukuyama on. And so the point he's trying to make, which I won't really do deal with in any sort of deep way in my, in my model or in the experiments I do, is that liberal societies are certainly in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, and they're very good, and they are formally, if you think about the theory of a liberal society or the liberal state, they have ways of thinking about the relationship between individuals and the state, and of course individuals and other individuals. And the point Fukuyama is making is we are increasingly now facing a situation where we have to think about rights and freedoms of individuals versus rights and feelings of groups. Uh, and, and that's, uh, that's a, I mean, I'm not sufficiently a political theorist or a theorist of ideas to, to, to have a full understanding of this, but it, it's clear that if you have groups which are asking for rights, uh, then you can't deal with them just the way you would deal with um, you know, an individual's rights. And, and so that's a, a key sort of challenge that he, he's sort of developing in his work. And so going back to the uh, point where I'm, which I started with, what I want to do is to present to you, because it's a very loaded, very controversial, very contemporary topic, what, what I want to do is to ask in a very basic setting, uh, without many of the emotional overtones, I want to present to you a very simple experiment in which there are going to be two actions. You can think of them as up and down, or A and B, or you can think of them as pink and red, or blue and red. And um, so if you, if you have Americans, so if you, if you have an American orientation, you might think of them as blue and red because of the two political parties. Okay. But, and so the idea here is simply, you want to do what others are doing, but you prefer, let's say, blue, and I prefer red. Okay. But if everyone here is doing blue, I would definitely do blue. If everyone here is doing red, I prefer to do red. Okay. But I prefer red, okay. let's say, or you prefer blue. So I just want to ask, in that very simple setting, how you're going to make choices, and what will be the mechanisms that will take us towards a majority conformism outcome versus an outcome where we are going to uh, diverge and have diversity. Okay. So in that very, very, very minimal setting, I want to pose that problem. Uh, the, the, so let me, to, to give you a sense of, you know, it's not just an intellectual exercise. I mean, I myself have migrated many times, and I'll show you a little picture uh, to give you an idea. Uh, so I'm familiar with the challenges of migrating, and let me try and see if I can... Um, so I have a brilliant student, uh, and he's prepared this um, Google Earth thing. It's going to actually be very slow, so I'm going to speed it up. So what this picture does um, is that it actually shows my many migrations. Okay, so you might think it's a little self-publicity. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, I was born in this little, actually not so little anymore, 
with a town in North India in my grandparents' house, and then I moved to this town in East India, which is about 2,000 kilometers away in the east, because my father was working there. Um, and when I was about 14, uh, this is a sprawling town. It used to be a tiny this little town when I was growing up there. When I was 14, I was sent off to boarding school back to Delhi. Okay, so when I was about for, for two years, um, so that's the move back. Um, this is to, to New Delhi. And a few years later, I went to business school about five years later uh, to a town called Ahmedabad. No, this is, we are still in Delhi. <laughs> this is the India Gate if you've been to Delhi. I was living actually right next to that. Um, so, um, and so I went to business school and, and let me speed it up a bit because it's, um, so, so I moved to Cornell in 1986, uh, which is, many of you have been there. It's a, it's a beautiful campus. And this is where I had the good fortune of meeting Patrick, and a little before that, my, my wife. So, so we were there for about four years. It's a beautiful uh, campus if you, uh, this is actually the campus in, in Cornell. Uh, you can see Uris Hall there. Uh, and so after that, I've been living in Europe for about 25 years, and let me just, um, show you that I moved to the UK in 2001, about 18 years ago, and I've been in Cambridge. So, um, okay, so this is Cambridge, as many of you probably see, that's the King's College Chapel. And so, so I, I think that, um, what I want to talk about, partly, um, I, I think the experiment that we are going to do is, you will see it's very minimal, but I thought that it was good to do an experiment like that because I think it reflects my own experience as well, and I'll come back to that once I have presented the experiment. So let me, um, let me see if I can do this in a simple way, okay, because I'm... Um, so Patrick was urging me to be serious and have some <laughs> mathematics, and I was trying to uh, say that, you know, that could not go down very well. <laughs> so, okay. Um, okay, so let's go through this slide. So there are two possible actions. Okay, and as I said, we all want to do what others are doing. Um, maybe I can write something here. Uh, okay, and so there are going to be two kinds of uh, groups here. There will be a group which is a majority group, and we will think of that as a group, you know, which majority of people prefer to, do, let's say, do action up. There are some people who prefer action, the minority action, they will be the prefer people who prefer action down. And so a lot of the work has looked at how the minority size matters. Okay, so the big takeaway from that literature is that if the minority size is very small, it will conform essentially to the majority's view. If the minority size grows above a thre threshold, it will then start asserting itself, and then you will have diversity as the outcome. It's not probably very surprising. I think the interesting thing is the threshold. It's reasonably stable, and, and that's sort of been the takeaway message. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the talk today and, uh, is that I'm going to actually focus on minorities which are large. Okay, so this is a minority in the experiment that's going to be quite large. And uh, so this is a setting where in principle they should be asserting themselves. Okay, and what I will show you is whether they um, assert themselves and they want to do things differently or they conform is going to depend on a very simple mechanism, which is, uh, I've referred to, here, referred to it here as a freedom to form ties, uh, but basically the idea here is that you can have a situation where I'm obliged to meet with every one of you. That's one setting. The other setting is that I can pick the people I'm going to interact with. Okay, so that's the link formation aspect. That's the network formation aspect. Of course, the, the way this thing is set up, it is in my interest to link with everyone. Okay. Nevertheless, I can choose who to link with. And I'm going to argue that this freedom to choose 
uh, is going to be critical and it's going, to dis it's going to shape whether you're going to go for a conformism outcome or diversity outcome. Uh, from an economic point of view, one interesting feature of this setting is that the minority actually gains by conforming to the majority's point of view. Okay, so in this setting, uh, this is a very particular setting, but so when the minority goes for its own preferred action, it's of course harming the majority, but it's also harming itself. Okay, so, so I think it's actually you know, somewhat counterintuitive. Um, okay, so let me um, make it sort of, uh, so as I said, there are two actions, up um, and down. And so what's going to happen is, um, so let me show you a picture. This may be easier to understand. So in this picture, you have three graphs, and each of them has one thing in common, and that is that there are 15 people. So each of these um, triangles and circles is a person. So there are 15 people in each of them. And if you look hard, you will see that if you, for instance, look at this triangle here, um, you know, you, I, can, I can assure you that this person has 14 links. So that means this person is linked with everyone. And that is true in all the three um, networks. So what's happening is you will also see there are eight circles and there are seven triangles. So the circle um, is a reflection of your preferred preference. Okay, so that means you're a circle type person, and the triangle is a triangle type person. And what's happening here, the colors here reflect the action choices. So here you see that everyone's chosen blue, so that's an action choice people have made. Uh, so, you, so what we have in mind is that blue is the preferred action of the circle type people. Here we see everyone's chosen red, uh, and here we see that the blues who prefer blue have chosen, so it's like the circles who prefer blue have chosen blue, and the triangles who prefer red have chosen red. So this is the case where you have diversity. Okay, so so you, here you have conformism on the majority's pre preference, here you have conformism on the minority's preferred action, and here you have each group doing their preferred action. Okay, so that's the, so why is this an interesting problem from an economic point of view? Um, let me to give you a first impression of what the economics of this is. Okay, so what's going on here is, um, so when I play with Patrick and we play the same action, uh, we get some payoff, okay, we get some earnings. So he talks in a language, I talk in the same language, we understand each other, but if he speaks in French and I speak in English, we probably don't understand each other very well. And then, you know, we, we basically get very little reward from the interaction. So in our pair, if we choose different actions, let's say we choose the different languages, we get a payoff zero. Okay. On the other hand, if we coordinate an up, let's think of up as French, then we both get some payoff. But Patrick gets six because he prefers French, and I get four, I don't prefer, I prefer English. If we coordinate an English, on the other hand, then he gets four and I get six. So that's the sort of setting. So now you can see what will happen um, if I now look at the 15 people, I can start asking myself uh, what happens in the payoffs. Okay, so let's just think about this payoff. What are the earnings of different people in this outcome? Right? So, so remember that the circles are the people who prefer the blue color. Okay? So let's look at this circle here. Let's think of the, the circle as Patrick. Okay, so Patrick has you know, he's got 15, he's, he's in this community of 15 people, everyone's doing his preferred, he's, everyone's speaking in French, that's his preferred outcome. So he's earning six from each of these, uh, you know, from each of these interactions, he's earning six. Okay. Um, and on the other hand, think of me as a triangle here, I'm speaking in French, people are understanding French, it's not ideal for me, and I'm getting four from each of these interactions. So you can see that you know I'm not as happy as he is from this outcome. Whereas out here, um, it's a little different because now I'm actually very happy as he's speaking in English, but of course he's not as happy. He's not miserable. He's still getting four, but he'd be happier with blue outcome. So what's interesting here is that we're all happy. We are doing you know I'm speaking in English with my group, 
Of course, when I speak with Patrick, we, we don't understand each other. He speaks French, I speak English, and we don't understand each other. But within the proper phone community, he's fine. Within the English-speaking community, I'm fine. But of course, when we go across, we don't earn anything. We earn zero. Okay. So if you add up these numbers, okay, you can see what will happen. So let me show you what's going to happen. Uh, this is what's going to happen in terms of so a minority person like myself, remember triangles are minority in this picture. Uh, what happens is that, uh, so, I've, so I've got the numbers slightly mixed up. So instead of four and six, it's two and four. So what happens is there are 15 of us here, and each of us, the interaction gives me two. So as a minority person, I get 30. But Patrick, as a majority person, gets 60. Uh, in the situation where you have diversity, you see the difference. A minority gets slightly less, okay, because they are interacting with seven people times four, so you get 28. And the majority is happier because there are eight of them, so they get 32. But notice that the minority is actually happier getting 30 rather than being on its own. And of course, the majority is clearly much happier in the conformance of a majority of them. So these outcomes I haven't really talked about yet, so we can we, we come to them in a moment. But what, what do I want you to sort of keep in mind? Um, I would like you to keep in mind that if you go with the conformism and majority outcome, the majority is clearly very happy because you're conforming to their preferred action. But the way I've set up this problem, actually the minority doesn't lose that much. It's not very happy. I mean, it will obviously be happier if you conform to the minority action. Okay, but it's been better than when it goes for diversity. Okay. That's the way I've set up the numbers. So, so what we want to do is, um, going back to this game, um, what you can show in this, uh, in this, if you write down the thing mathematically, what you can show is that if I were to be in this completely connected world, there are three possible outcomes. There are what economists call equilibrium outcomes, national equilibrium outcomes. You can have everyone conforming to blue, everyone conforming to red, and this diversity outcome. These are the only three things that can happen. So one question you would have, you should ask, what does happen in, in, in real world situations which are motivating this exercise? Notice that I have kept the minority to be very large. It's seven versus eight. So it's a very large minority. You can easily see if the minority had only three people, then you would expect that they would always conform. And indeed, in our experiments, they always conform. So the interesting challenge is what happens when the minority is large. So, so this is one case we want to keep in mind. And the other case we want to think about is where each of us uh, chooses to link with others. Okay. The cost of linking is zero. So in fact, it's exactly the same as when you know we were in the complete network. Uh, but now, these three outcomes are possible. Okay. So here's a, uh, this is an outcome of integration. So we link with everyone. Okay. Uh, so we arrive at the, what is known as a complete network. Everyone's connected with everyone. And this is an equilibrium outcome because it's no different from the other setting. This is also an equilibrium outcome. Um, and of course, interestingly, you have these outcomes, right, where the minority and the majority go off into the segregate. Okay, that's also an outcome. Um, so what's happening here is that the, um, the majority, eight, is one community. The minority, seven, is another community. They have no links across and they're leading parallel lives. Um, and you can have more complicated arrangements like this, uh, but there's a variety of outcomes. But what I would like you to take away from this um, model is that when you allow people to form links amongst themselves, you give rise to the possibility of segregation, which is not, of course, a possibility in a complete network by, by definition. So, and this is true even when the costs of linking are zero. So, so what we want to do is we want to ask what happens when you fix complete interaction with everyone? What's the equilibrium people select? And then you ask 
when you allow people to connect with others, what do they pick? So, so that's sort of focusing our minds on the pure um, effect of the, the freedom to choose connections. Okay. Does that make a difference? And of course, I wouldn't be here if the result was that it doesn't make a difference. Because it's going to be that the result is going to be a huge impact. So, so that's the that's the experiment. Okay, I've, I've already given you a pretty clear idea, uh, but it's clear that so socially, when you add up all the payoffs, but also when you look at the payoffs of each of the two groups, um, it's better to conform to the majority action. So economists would say that conforming to the majority action is pretty dominant. It's better for the majority, but also for the minority. So. Okay, so, so we want to understand, here are some possible outcomes with endogenous networks. This is what happens with exogenous networks, and we want to understand how do people actually choose to behave um, when we offer them the choice in a laboratory setting. So that's what I will be presenting um, now. So the subjects, uh, we're going to have an experiment where you will have 15 human subjects um, in each group, and we will have six groups for each, sort of for the endogenous and the exogenous treatment, um, and there will be 25 rounds, they will play the game, uh, and as I said, the key treatment is in one treatment you will have a complete network, and you have to choose behavior, and in the other treatment you will have choice of network and then choosing the action. Okay. And so, um, and we know that similar things can happen in equilibrium in both the settings. Okay, so this experiment was carried out in Valencia and there are some numbers here just to, uh, each experiment took about 100 minutes, so it's actually quite long. Um, and it's roughly, it's quite balanced, the gender uh, balance in the subject pool. Um, so how am I doing for time? I find you have a half an hour. Oh. 20 minutes from 50 minutes of a record. So, um, okay, so this is, for some of you, I think this may be, you know, very, very standard, but for some of you it may be a bit new. So let me just walk you through how the experiment is. Um, you know how the experiment works. So you have 15 people sitting in front of a computer screen, and this is what they see on the computer screen. Uh, they they see that you know you're player 14, uh, that's that person there, and you're told, okay, you should propose links with the other 14 people. So you propose links, and uh, now what happens is this is a network that's created, okay. Uh, your player 14, so those are the red links. Uh, and notice that some of the links are not actually, they're, they're light, that's because they haven't actually been reciprocated. So 14 proposed a link to four, four did not reciprocate, so the link has not been formed. Okay, so the bright red links are the ones that have actually been formed. So that's the network that you, that subjects have created. It's a fairly dense network. And now once you see the network, you choose action up or down. Okay. So now um, 14 in this case has chosen action up. And, um, and what happens is that he has, you know, many, uh, so, you know, he had all these partners or, or, or neighbors or contacts. And some of them have chosen down. So, you know, he's not coordinating with them, but he, most of his contacts have actually chosen up. So um, he's coordinating with seven of his connections. And uh, so he's getting, you know, he's earning something from the interactions. Um, and he's getting something just by being playing the game. And so he'll get 32 points. And that's the total points he's earned. So that's the way the game works. And you do it repeatedly for 25 times. Okay, so let me show you the first um, So I'm going to show you a, a, a picture a movie based on the data and um, 
that we collected so um, remember there were six groups so you can see there are six groups here and I'm going to run the movie and um, so you see um, round by round what's happening um, So you see that you have conformity for the majority action in five groups out of six. And in the six groups, you know, you have the diversity outcome. So that's the first thing that um, is the first finding. And so now let me show you what happens. Um, so what I want to do is, I want to compare this with the, what happens in the endogenous uh, linking case where the linking cost is zero. So in fact, there is no material uh, problem. You know, I can always form a link with everyone, but once I form a link with everyone, I'm really in the same situation as I was in the complete network, so I should also make the same choices. Okay, so that's the thinking, and I'm going to show you a film now. Um, So you'll see that links are moving around because this is a setting, you know, game where people are forming networks. And so what you see here is that there's the diversity outcome in all the six groups. The minority is doing red and the majority is doing blue. But you also see that the network is actually very dense. In fact, just by looking at it, you might think it is basically a complete network. So, so this is the um, this is the motivation behind the title of the talk. This is a highly integrated society, and it is clearly it has diversity. So, so this is the first finding of the paper um, that you. This is really the key takeaway finding of the paper. You had a complete network, and you got conformity. You have now we have allowed subjects to create networks, and they create essentially a very dense network. So to give you an idea about how dense it is, all the possible links that can exist in this network is 105. It's easy to see, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's 15 people, so they can have in total, you know, 105 links. And on average, you have 95 links being created in this society. Okay. So it's close to over 90% of the links are being created. It's a very dense network. <coughs> Nevertheless, and I just want to draw your attention to this, that by the time I'm in round period seven, you know, actually there is a lot of diversity. It's very, very rapid so take, uh, convergence to diversity. And once you're there, um, you know, you barely move. There's occasionally some experimentation, uh, but, you know, occasionally there's somebody trying things out. But it's... Um, by round 10, you know, it's pretty stable. So you have, um, so if there's one thing you want to take away from this talk, then it's this contrast where when you allow people to choose, these are free links, people form a lot of links, nevertheless they go with their preferred action. So the question is, why is this happening? So here's a picture that summarizes that um, that, picture, that, that, that sort of dynamic pattern. Here you see that this is the complete exogenous network. And we see that gradually, the minority, very gradually, it actually goes towards conformity. Whereas when you do the endogenous network, and people are linking, making choices about link, links, they actually um, go down to diversity very rapidly. So, um, and, and you know, we know that in all cases, they go to diversity. And uh, so this is a link on the level of integration. Uh, and what you see here is, these are the links, the blue links are the links within the preference, same preference community. So the minority, of course, fully connects within itself. The majority fully connects within itself. But across, 
you're not, it looks very dense, but remember there are about 10 links missing. So 105 minus 95. The 10 links that are missing are almost entirely the links across the two communities. So that's really the subtle, uh, very subtle sort of difference between the two um, network outcomes. Okay? It's, but that seems to be enough to drive this uh, completely contrasting sort of outcome. Notice the majority never really changes its behavior. The majority is always and very, very early on, it just does its own action. It's the minority that's moving around. So, so, so that's sort of the um, key. Um, so here's really the big takeaway from the paper uh, in terms of the experiment. What you find is that when you are obliged to interact with everyone, you go with the minority, majority's preferred action. Um, but when you have a choice, then you, uh, you, you form a lot of links, but you don't form all the links across. You form all the links within, and that small difference, uh, if you think about 10 links, and there are, let's say, seven or eight subjects, it's barely one link per person which is missing okay, across. So it's really very, very, um, you know, one out of 14 links, really. So, so it's really um, quite subtle. If you so, so that's sort of the idea. And we, what, um, in, in the remaining time, uh, what I want to do is to give you, uh, to develop a little bit more the idea of why is this happening. And, and to do this, I, I want to look at uh, two cases where uh, links are, actually you get <coughs> right to form a link, you know, so if you form a link, so if Georg and I form a link, uh, then actually we get paid. Okay? And we also have a treatment where uh, when he and I form a link, we have to pay for the link. So the intuition is that if uh, we are paid to form a link, so if we form a link, we get some bonus, then there should be even greater pressure to form a link. So if we don't form a link in that case, it's like a costly action not to form a link. And the thought is that I would take this costly action only if there were some returns to it. And the returns are maybe, you know, in terms of my signaling my identity or my signaling my intention to uh, go with my preferred action. So that's the thought. Okay, and, and you will see that um, uh, we'll... So let me show you... Um, So the negative cost treatment um, is an interesting case because when we uh, looked at it first, uh, our thought was that uh, for sure, if we are all being paid to form links, we will definitely form all the links, and then we will be in the complete network, and we will definitely then conform. And you will see uh, what will happen is um, so you will see that the network is even denser than in the free links treatment. It's hard to make out. They all look very dense. But you have to believe me when I say there are 100 links being created, so five more links. And there are some networks which are complete in this. Nevertheless, you get diversity as the outcome. So, so, so this is a setting where people, it seems, strategically do not create all the links across the communities, and it's really five links, and, and that's enough for them to coordinate, to successfully uh, separate themselves. So, so that's, I think this is a more striking illustration of so the network now is basically indistinguishable from a complete network. Okay, and you see the, um, so, So you see the linking, right? Um, it's even more, it's closer to the complete network. Um, uh, but then you look at the behavior and you see that, um, uh, you know, it's essentially very quick convergence to diversity. Um, so, so what I, sorry to keep track of time. So let me show you, um, a more, if I, I think in some ways, a more plausible treatment. Um, uh, 
Okay, so this is a setting where links are costly. Okay, so um, so you see what happens here is what you might have thought would happen. Uh, you essentially get a complete, almost completely segregated society because I'm not going to form links with Patrick knowing that he's going to speak French and I'm going to speak English because that's going to give me a zero payoff and links are costly. I'm going to make a loss. Anticipating that, I don't form links across. And so you have, you know, occasionally people forming links across, but you have uh, almost perfectly segregated society, uh, and you have diversity. Okay, so, so what we saw was that the uh, the original result was when the linking was free, and you got log linking, but you got this diversity. So of course, when you make links costly, that will reinforce the diversity flavor, and that will of course push people to not forming links across communities. So now I think that I've shown you uh, an experiment where the cost of linking is quite large, but we also have run experiments with very small linking costs, and you get essentially perfect segregation. So and, and you get uh, notice that um, as you will remember, um, theoretically there is always an equilibrium, even in the case where you have large positive costs, where you form a complete network and you conform to the majority's preferred action. There's always that equilibrium. Okay, so of course it never played, but it's always an equilibrium. And it is not only an equilibrium, but it's actually a Pareto dominant equilibrium. Okay, so so um, this is quite, a, you know, it's it's probably not surprising given the earlier results I presented, but it is it is actually quite disturbing. So okay. So let me try and wrap up and open the disc, you know, flow to discussion uh, because um, there's sort of... So what, what I've tried to do here is um, to get into, if you like, the mechanics of how coordination takes place and how people who may have different preferences about you know, language or dress or food or religion, etc., a variety of things when they have to interact in a society, how they go about making choices, okay, and what are the welfare implications. So what I've tried to do here is I've tried to take away many sort of high-level macro kind of concerns uh, that people may have, that people think matter a lot when we think about what's happening in contemporary society. So what I've tried to do is to show you that there are very sort of fundamental, very simple mechanisms that can explain why people, which, you know, when there's a majority and a minority, how uh, the freedom to choose who you interact with can play a decisive role in whether you will conform or you will go, uh, you will not conform. And, and of course, I don't want to take this literally as, um, you, you know, what, how we should think of public policy, but, but it does seem to suggest that we need to be very careful about uh, so, in a liberal society, I think people would normally think that people have the freedom of association. People have the freedom to choose where to live, which school to go to, and which classes to be put in, and so on. And of course, this is an important aspect of a liberal society, but what this experiment suggests is that uh, there may be, um, you know, we need to ask ourselves how the freedom to associate can actually reinforce and uh, in, in deep ways <coughs> Uh, preferences, or in a in a very very minimal setting, where in fact I haven't given any labels, I have not set up any history uh, in this experiment. So, uh, so I think that's sort of the uh, big sort of takeaway from this experiment, because it's such a minimal setting. I think it suggests that freedom to choose links can make identity, however you define it. Here, it's defined in terms of payoffs. Actually, uh, it makes it salient because. People, I think, are facing very difficult coordination problems here. People are having to navigate a complex social environment, and they are looking for cues on how to solve these coordination problems. 
And by giving them the option of choosing who to be friends with, who to interact with, you make the problem easier. Uh, you basically simplify the problem and people pick that, uh, you know, they, they use that linking as a way to solve the coordination problem. And, and so there's a sense in which um, I think we have to ask, you know, how this, this is a very abstract experiment, uh, but I think it, my feeling is that it, it's actually simple enough that it should make us think about uh, a number of practical questions that people think about in organizations. Uh, so for instance, just to add, I'm the chair of the faculty in Cambridge, but one of the things I face is that I have colleagues from different parts of the economics. They want to have different parts of the building to themselves. Uh, and there are some colleagues who think this is actually very bad for corporate culture. And yet, you know, it would be better to mix the different fields. Because as you are aware, uh, when people are in a field, they, they start using that to lobby, you know, and they start using that to separate themselves from others. And so it's a fairly practical problem, whether econometricians should be in one corner of the corridor and theorists should be another corridor, you know, public economics people should be on another floor, or they should be all mixed up. Okay. And, and, and I think that, um, so this is quite far from this experiment, but I always feel that this experiment is sort of asking me to be careful, you know, how people should be, uh, you know, uh, there are of course many trade-offs in that sort of a decision, uh, but uh, so I'm going to stop and maybe open the floor to questions. We have actually plenty of time for questions. They are okay. Okay, I think we can start collecting questions. We have to collect questions first and then answer. Uh, well, it depends how different the questions are. If you know, if you collect the questions first. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> then you're, you're in <laughs> okay, I. Uh, think. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I have actually two questions. One concerns really the, the design of your experiment. What is not there, it seems, seems to be the what you call the instrumental value of diversity, which would actually mean that the more diverse the group is, however defined, the more should be the, the higher should be the overall payoff. Uh, in particular when they are connected, so when they are not segregated. Of course, a group that is segregated cannot... Um, so what, what do you think, how, how would, your, would your results change when you would try to integrate this? Because that seems to be one of the most important issue, most important benefits of, of diversity. Right. So, so I think uh, we have two questions. Yes. Uh, a second one, uh, on a, if you want, more fundamental level, um, what, when you think of identity, very often when you have these group identities, people cannot really make choices. When they are in, in, in a group, getting out of this group becomes extremely costly much more costly than what you have in your experiment. And uh, so in, 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 in a way, this framework where it's really uh, in a, an, an individual choice, I'm not so sure whether this uh, covers all the situations you, you, you have in mind or one can think of. Yeah, so I think the second question is much easier because it basically suggests that I'm making it very easy to separate and still you're not separating. So if I made it harder, you know, my, my conjecture would be that you would separate even less. In other words, so I think what might happen is that if there is an ostracism, you know, if I'm going and, you know, hanging out with the enemy, you know, what, if that's sort of, then of course you will get more segregation yeah. in the zero link sort of thing. Uh, so I, I mean, my gut feeling is that a small positive cost across links is probably, you know, one way to do it, and that would reinforce the segregation result. Um, when we did the negative cost or, you know, subsidy treatment, 
we, we did it because we didn't have a clear, we actually our view, our conjecture was that you would get the complete network and you would get the phones. But, you know, so it was really a surprise to us. Um, so I, I don't think the second issue is very, I don't think it's, uh, my sense is it will reinforce the results. The first issue, I, I think, I mean, I haven't written down a model of the kind you have in mind, but I think the, what it will do is that it, as long as the coordination problem remains central, you will still have these equilibria, but the payoff ranking, the welfare ranking will, will change. So in particular, it may be that the, um, the diversity outcome, because there are these instrumental value, you know, you, you may actually have, a, you know, you could write down the model where socially it's better to have diversity. You know, so, so, um, sure. so, so that element of this uh, experiment that take away, uh, you know, you, you won't get, you know, because actually it's a good thing. Uh, to the extent that, you know, welfare and efficiency pushes you, again, I would think that that would push you even more towards the result you get with endogenous. But you may be right that even with a complete exogenous network, efficiency might push you towards, you know, separate, you know, towards diversity. In that sense, the results might be mm -hmm. good. So, uh, there might be one thing when I go to Belgium and I see that there's Flemish and Walloon, and I know the, the fraction of them, and that might dictate how I might respond. Now, if you put me in Brussels, uh, I don't know the fraction of Walloon or Flemish, and that might also determine my actions afterwards. So in your yeah. setup with the exogenous variation sort of structure here, you sort of, I already know the types that I'm interacting with, and I know there's a majority and a minority. What, have you guys thought about like the, high, the notion that this might or may or may not be a majority or not? Here it's sort of given what the majority and minority is. What if be a bit more, more precise, where if there's high order uncertainty on the types that I'm interacting with, we can also choose that one. Would I, should it be like, do you think it's, is it robust to smaller deviations of uncertainty on who the majority is, or do I need to have like large deviations in uncertainty, or have you thought anything about that? Okay, so, is, I mean, so I think you're asking the number of, so, so I think that my, so, from a sort of, I quite take the point that I think in many real world, realistic settings, you actually don't know the composition. Okay. So I think it, it would be, um, so this is a benchmark treatment where you know everything. Okay. I know exactly your type, I know how many types there are, and I know how many people belong to types and so on. But you're posing a very natural sort of, uh, you know, next step where I don't know the types. Well, I know that there are eight uh, circles and seven triangles, but I don't know what your type is. Okay, I run into you, and then we start doing things, and we realize, oh, okay, you're you know, you're you're a round man, right? Or, you know, and and so on. So so um, so I mean, I think the point is well taken. I don't have anything. Let me see. So so I, I was wondering whether this ex this model would be a special, you know, would be a familiar model in terms of ordination games. Uh, because this is, um, you know, and whether making that uncertainty more important would solve the equilibrium multiplicity problem. Now, I, I, I haven't thought about it, so it may be that there is a way of introducing uncertainty on, on the number of majority and minority to help resolve the equilibrium selection problem. Uh, but, I mean, I can't refer to you to a paper, you know, straight away. But with regard to the experiment itself, my feeling is that that's a very nice experiment to think of. You know, when you don't know who is what or how many people belong, it could be a one of you know two different configurations, and you're learning alongside. You know, um, sure. I mean, I, I think it's a very nice idea. We've, I, I have nothing uh, given how surprised we were by the results we found here. I would not dare to conjecture. You know how people would play the game. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. I have, in fact, two questions. The first, is there a principal reason why the payoffs are symmetrical? Because you could think that if you're part of the minor minority, you know, changing sides and taking the choice of the majority has a lower payoff than the opposite, for instance. And then the f if none of the two decide to change and they both affirm their preference, you give a zero payoff 
But you could think perhaps that if the society is fairly open uh, to, to diversity, then keeping your initial choice should have a small positive payoffs. And if you're in a society uh, which is not open to diversity, you could have a small negative payoffs for keeping your positions. So that's the first question. The second is, do I understand you well that social networks are reducing the cost of connection and therefore are favoring diversity in society? Is that an interpretation of your... Um, the social networks are facilitating the establishment of connections and therefore the cost of these connections to other members of the network. Is that a valid interpretation? Yeah, so, so, so I think these are very interesting questions. Um, again, I think the, the first one is more in the spirit of you know, making it more realistic, maybe making it more uh, enriching. You know, if you have asymmetric sort of payoffs and um, I, I, again, I don't uh, want to, you know, hazard a guess on which way it's going to go. Whether, you know, how it will modify the theorems or how it will modify the experimental uh, outcomes. That, I mean, I think it's very, it's, it's a natural thing to think about. Um, I don't have very much insight. You know, we haven't thought about uh, this asymmetries. I, so uh, I'm going to be lecturing on gender uh, later this week. And one observation that I have, which is actually not my observation, people have suggested it to me. And I think that, I, I mean, again, I don't have anything very uh, formal to say. But I've, uh, the observation I had and that people made to me is, so this is a context where, let me do a bit of publicity for the gender talk. So, so what's happening is this is I'm looking at the community of economists. Actually, it's, it's interesting. It's also happening in sociology, but we're looking at a community where women have become much more present. They were essentially invisible 40 years ago. You know, there were four percent of economists were women researchers, and and now it's more like 30 percent. And so, some of my colleagues said to me that I think behavior how people think of minorities changes as a minority size changes. Okay, so, so it may be that, I, I think actually reflecting upon it, it seems to me that that's, that could be a first order factor. So in addition to what you were saying, that there are these asymmetries, these asymmetries themselves might actually change with the size of the minority and the majority. And so it's a very, I think it's a very rich problem. And I think you can look at it, you, you know, in sort of different dimensions. Um, and what we were trying to do was, in a sense, take an absolutely baseline setting, you know, to try and get a first handle on what. And, um, and since the results we, uh, we we found were very different from what we were expecting, that itself took the whole paper. Um, on I think the um, the the second um, um, now I'm blanking out. What, sorry, could you tell me repeat the second question? No, but in my view, Facebook and Twitter. Oh yes, sure, sure. Yes, yes, yes. Are yes. reducing the cost of yes. establishing multiple connections. Yes, yes. So, so I'm, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what, which way you are going on this, but one idea that people have, uh, have, 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 have sort of, have been putting forward on this. Is this so, so? So, so the idea. So, one way of thinking about your question is that it was very costly for me, uh, you know, to form links 20 years ago and maintain them. Now it's become very, very easy for me to maintain links or at least keep in touch with people, you know, through different social media. Uh, and so, I'm going to form lots of links, and and that's going to make the world a much more integrated place. But there's another way to look at this, uh, and that is that. You know, there are, I have some strange ideas about the world, okay, and I have some rather strange ideas about how, let's say, evolution happens. But I'm around people who, who I know would think I'm completely crazy. So I keep quiet and I'm sort of, you know, I keep to myself. And, but now I realize, I go online and I realize that I'm not alone. You know, there are a lot of people like me who have rather unusual ideas. You know, even in Cambridge, you know, after Darwin, people have ideas that evolution never happened. Okay, so, so you know, now I go out and they actually, they may not live in Cambridge, but they're they all around the world. And what happens is that 
I can form a whole world, a, a, a very rich social network, which actually involves people who have equally, you know, rather unusual ideas, uh, which would not have been possible 20 years ago uh, if I was living in Cambridge. So what that suggests is actually the network gets denser, but it gets much more fragmented. Okay, and so people have made this argument as to why people have very can hold more extreme views of politics than they could 20 years ago, because now they inhabit sort of like parallel universes because of the way the social network works. So it's not my point that you know this is true or this is not true, but I'm just saying that I think your point could go either way. You know, whether you sort of uh, so in this experiment, of course, you were forming not many more links. Um, uh, because the way this experiment was set up, there was no opinion issue, there was no you know, issue of identity, if you like, because it was minimal. Uh, but I, I could easily see that if I added this, you know, if I, for instance, I added this idea uh, of cheap links to ostracism, that people of my type found out I'm linking with people across, they penalize me. Uh, then, of course, you know, it could have very different implications here. We have three more questions, and let's just All right, uh, thank you. Um, if you could cl clarify in the experiment on which basis people are asked to, to form links, do they only know that they belong to the majority minority, or do they have additional information, like another player's gender, another player's level of education, income, for example? Uh, so, and also, for example, do they observe each other's actions? Is there maybe uh, some peer pressure going on that people from the majority only link with other people from the majority? So I feel obliged also to do that. So I, I wasn't really clear how the, the choices uh, functioned uh, that the, the players had to take. Uh, okay, so I, what I can do is maybe just walk you through the... So what's happening is that you... This is the first screen you see. So you see that... Uh, you are 14, and you see uh, there are these other 14 people, uh, and you see their type. Okay, the type is triangle or circle, and I think the circle is up, prefers up, and the triangle prefers down. And that's what you see. Okay, and then when you have created your network, then you see this network. So you see the proposals, and you see the created network. Um, you don't see anything about the demographics. So you don't see the gender and you don't see anything else. Okay, that's anonymized. And, and now you see this network and then you have to choose an action. Okay, so this is in every round. And of course you are playing um, 20 rounds. And so the subject five remains a circle in all the 20 rounds. And so of course you are going to be conscious if in round 15 you're going to have this history that you tried to form a link with five, but, but she never formed, or he or she never formed a link with you, or they always formed a link with you, but they always miscoordinated with you, right? So you will have that in your mind. Uh, does that help you? Yes, but for the rest, you don't know anything about the player's background. No, you, you don't. The first link. <coughs> no, yeah. you don't know anything. And in fact, at the end of the experiment, in principle, you are not supposed to also have side payments afterwards. Thank you. Um, I really love your research. I think it's fascinating. So uh, maybe to place my question in the context, so I'm a social psychologist. I've run uh, some experiments, and um, I'm interested in diversity, too. So first, the sort of interpretation. So I think your, your uh, results fit with what we know from social psychology research in the sense that at, at the short run, let's say, is, uh, is useful or it pays to conform for majority for minority what do you have in your in your study and it's also nice to see that at the long run more people have connections more they basically realize through the payoffs that there is uh, that is beneficial uh, it pays off to 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 have diversity so that is just uh, an interpretation now one thing i i disagree with you in terms of the interpretation uh, is the role of the size of uh, of minority so uh, my impression is not that is a matter of size of minority how large minority is uh, is rather of how uh, consistent and influential uh, minority is so let me explain you what so there is a research by um, Social psychologist Salomon Ash in the 50s, who have shown that in an experiment where you put majority and minority, actually my, my minority will tend to disagree if there is at least one single other participant who will disagree with him. So they don't have to be 10 others to disagree. If there is at least one, he will tend not to conform. And then he showed that how 
consistent uh, this minority will be and how much uh, this minority will manage to have influence over others that matters. So I thought that actually here in your studies through the networking, the linkages people make, basically what they are looking for is reinforcing this, uh, uh, this influence uh, both toward other minority people but also toward ma majority and also to our majority there are other studies on what is called um, uh, social cryptomnesia sometimes an idea that is defended by a minority let's say something innovative and so on or let's defend the uh, woman rights more this idea can be taken by majorities too and they start defending it too some somehow, somehow in my view in what your uh, experiments show is not the size that is uh, important, but through the linkages, the minority become more influential, both uh, uh, toward minority, but also toward majority. Majority start seeing, oh, actually interacting with this minority is really interesting. I, I, I keep finding, I mean, I, I, I see uh, more innovative ideas too, so let's give more place to, to, to a minority. So yeah, I was, my question is, what do you think about, is it size or is it, something else like uh, consistency, influence, influence from minority toward? Yeah, so, uh, so I should say that, I mean, so let me just first of all mention that we ran the same experiment with three people in the minority and 12 in the major majority. Okay. And we always got the minority conforming. Okay, so, so in this very basic setting, the size matters. But what you are saying, I think is, um, you know, it's actually thinking of a slightly different uh, setting, where, uh, which is actually closer to, I think, the example that we were discussing uh, earlier about, let's say, I believe that, you know, evolution never happened, okay? And so, but there's just two or three of us who have this idea. Or maybe there's just one, one there's just me who has this idea. And, uh, but, you know, how, the fact that I have this strong idea, how this could actually become important in a social context, how, when you have a network sort of thing, how that could get amplified. So that idea is, I, I think it has a slightly different, um, in my view, it has a slightly different uh, flavor and, and the way I would model it would be quite different. Um, and so uh, we haven't run experiments on that, but there is actually quite a rich literature on opinion formation in social networks. And one element of that is indeed this idea that uh, when you have strong opinions and if you're a minority, if you're in the right place in the network, you can dominate the network. Uh, so, so that sort of idea uh, has been explored. But uh, my sense is that that's slightly different from this coordination issue uh, that we are looking at, which is a very pure and simple coordination problem. Uh, but I mean, I take your point, I mean, that you, know, if you have strong opinions and, they can, and it's a small minority opinion, the network can amplify that. So that, that, that point, I think, is well taken and you know, this is a slightly different. No, just to, to finish up, I thought it's a, a little bit of a pessimistic view to consider that only if minority is in big size, then they will make a change and they will be sure. able to promote yes, that. that I agree. Yes. So in, the others would be, even if you are a small yeah. minority, but you are rather influential, then diversity could become a reality too. Yeah. I, I agree that maybe it can be set up differently in your yeah. Um, my question relates actually to the to the previous question. Um, what I was missing a little bit is how we got to, to the point where the minority was so large, right? Uh, which is your which is your your starting point, right? We have two groups, uh, but the minority is almost as big as the majority here. Right? Because in your setup, indeed, if it's a very small minority, it disappears. It disappears in the sense that it conforms. Yeah. It conforms to the majority. In that sense, it disappears. It's not anymore a minority. It's a minority that conforms. It's part of the majority. It's not anymore a minority, yeah. right? You must have, I mean, uh, what I would have liked to see is how did we get to the point where the minority is so big? Because it seems to me that in your case, and that's why I think the, 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 the question about Belgium was very relevant. Uh, you could have Belgium, you could have uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, I think when you have a situation where the minority is almost as big as the majority, okay, you have segregation. If you look at nations, means they're going to split. They, what, what's the point? 
of being together here. Right? You each do your own thing and you are big enough to survive in your own group. Right? You don't need the uh, you don't need to uh, you don't need the other group here. You have your group and the other group. They are both more or less of the same size, and that can be a stable equilibrium. Right? Well, if one is very small, it will it will be eaten up by uh, by it will conform to to the majority. So, what I would have liked to understand is it's it's slightly different model, I suppose, is how one could get. To a situation where the minority would be almost as large as the majority in an endogenous manner, rather than okay, in your setup, said if you have a small minority, it disappears, right? It's always conforms to the majority. But can one have where can one have a situation where indeed the minority not only manages to 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 retain its let's say its identity, but even to grow. Right. So, so I think you have in mind. Uh, um, let me sort of try and think about this. So, I mean, I think you have in mind a rather different set of issues. And I mean, I, um, I, so let me take a step back. Let's let me put it this way: yeah. the the problem that you started with. Okay. The uh, say migrants. It's not this kind of situation. No, it's not. It's, it's not, let me. Right? But it's not. But I think it's very important to not actually. So I'm going to make some remarks on I think the point you're raising uh, in a moment. But the reason I think what I was doing, what I've presented here, is related to this issue of the you know contemporary. So sort of why I think it has a contemporary resonance is that I think that because people think there is something very new that's happening, or people think it's very complex, there's some political economic development. What I'm trying to do here is I think trying to draw out the idea that I think there's probably very simple cognitive issues at work here, uh, which is that I think you're facing a very complicated coordination problem in a very minimal setting, and that's going to lead you to conforming or choosing diversity, purely because I think helping build the links help you resolve the coordination complexity. That's, if you like, the simple abstract point that's been made here. It's not really uh, addressing the kind of question that you're asking, which I think is very important, but it's, it's trying to say that I think if you abstract from all that, why, do, why does segregation happen? Why, do, why does linking matter? That's what this is trying to say in a sort of slightly abstract way that, look, it helps because we don't have a fully developed theoretical model, but it's saying it's helping us solve a coordination problem, essentially. Now, go, turning to the issue about group size and, and so on, uh, in, a, in a paper that my student, Brian e. Reich, has written, um, what, we've tried, what, what she's tried to do in her work is actually do the kind of exercise I think you may have in mind, you have a minority and you have a majority, and what happens as the minority size grows? Okay. So that's the experiment, the you know, thought experiment they have, they've done, and they've actually done some empirical work on what happens on that. So how does the model work? So the idea in that paper is that you have things, like in this model, where you have different preferences. Okay. So you may have different food habits, you may have different views about dress, or, or maybe about you know when you fast, etc. But there are a number of things about which you actually don't have different views. So how you play squash, or whether you play football, or you play squash, or you know you play tennis, that's not something that you necessarily have different views about. You know how how much money you make. You may not have different views about that. So so the idea of that model is so the larger is the space of those sorts of the larger the weight you place on um, you know, those kinds of um, dimensions of your life, uh, the more you could have diversity. Because basically, you lead a life where there are people who are doing rather different things, but it doesn't bother you because there are so many things you share with them. And there's a private life you lead you know, where you do your own thing. But if that dimension becomes small and the differences become large, then of course you have a situation which is closer to this setting. Okay, so so the, 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 the idea in that paper is, you know, that I thought that was quite creative is, how do you think of a new culture emerging when the minority changes, you know, the size? 
And, and so that paper looks at some of these issues. Uh, but I think my own sense is this is quite far from the problem in this paper. Yes, I also think it's a very interesting uh, research agenda. Um, a bit connected to the earlier question, it's true that here uh, you can have, uh, well, and you use the, the example of language, which I think is, uh, is uh, valid here, because indeed people may have preferences and they may conform, even though conforming, as you know, it's, uh, you know, my English is not native English, huh? so uh, I, could, uh, I could try, but uh, so uh, there may be some uh, inefficiencies, uh, but uh, in a number of other cases, like gender, uh, it's a bit, it's very costly to conform. Uh, the, by the way, gender is an area where uh, indeed you have uh, two groups that are pretty stable and uh, you, will keep, uh, you will keep that. But even from the, the other cases, uh, I think that um, the, if people just want to live in the same place, uh, they may decide that they stay together uh, and then it may indeed end up in civil war but uh, otherwise I think uh, they will uh, I guess a bit Belgium is a bit uh, that example that uh, people early on uh, I guess the elites on Flemish side would speak French to conform uh, now it has uh, indeed uh, uh, this kind of conformism has gone down uh, and maybe the French speaking side has not gone up uh, that much but it has uh, followed the uh, the evolution of economic power. Uh, but interestingly, one thing that could be added here is a, a third strategy, like uh, English is developing as a compromise solution. And uh, especially if you have more than two groups, uh, I guess in Brussels now, people, a lot of people don't speak either French or Dutch, but they all speak English. Uh, so uh, in that sense, I think uh, it's something that could be, uh, could be a solution, depend, and it might be interesting to see the interaction with the way people form links or not, because uh, it's happening only in some circles, uh, this kind of thing, that tend to live by themselves in, in Brussels. Huh? The expats, uh, they, uh, they, they, they would all speak English. And, uh, I don't have anything more to add to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we exhausted uh, Sanjeev a little, so thanks a lot and thanks for everybody for the questions.